Welcome to Single Malt History with Gareth Russell, pouring out your serving of pure, distilled, intoxicating, and occasionally delicious history. For second-class passengers who had boarded the Titanic at either Southampton in England or Cherbourg in France, Breakfast was served on Thursday the 11th of April in their dining saloon with its oak panelling and long tables at which they sat in mahogany swivel chairs bolted to the floor. Fresh fruit was on offer along with tea and coffee, marmalade, jams and maple syrup which were provided along with passengers' choice of fruit, fresh fish or salted fish, Porridge, oats, there was ox kidneys with bacon, sausages, ham and egg, breakfast potatoes, rolls and Irish soda bread, the latter of which is frankly God's work. For some passengers in second class, their trip on the Titanic was only the beginning for an even longer journey. This was true, for instance, for Joseph-Philippe Le Mercier Laroche, an engineer who was travelling home to Haiti with his pregnant French wife Juliette and their two daughters, Simone and Louise. Laroche's uncle, Cincinnatus Le Comte, had actually been elected president of Haiti the previous summer, and Laroche was travelling back home so that his third child could be born in Haiti rather than France. I mentioned in yesterday's episode that tickets on third class cost as much as second class in many other ships, and the same was true if translated for second. La Roche and his family had originally booked to cross the Atlantic on a new French luxury liner, the France, which was due to sail on her first voyage a week later. However, They found out that the French line's policy was that children in first class on their ships had to eat in the nursery during the voyage and that they weren't permitted to join their parents in the dining saloon. The La Roche family didn't like that, so they decided to rebook on a ship sailing a little earlier, but where they would be able to dine with their two young daughters. However, it turned out that the price of a first-class ticket on the France was roughly the same as a second-class ticket on the Titanic. So Joseph, Juliette and their two girls boarded the Titanic at Cherbourg on the evening of Wednesday the 10th in second class. Once they reached New York, they would board another ship that would carry them to Haiti. This gives us an idea of the vast network of global travel connected by the shipping lines in 1912. Some of the Titanic's other second-class passengers really typified this. Also on board was Masabumi Hosono, who was a civil servant from Hokura in Japan. He had been in Russia on a government fact-finding mission inspecting the rapid progress of the Russian railway network. After Russia, Hosono had travelled to London before continuing on to America, from which he would eventually return home to Japan. Uh, I don't know if you can hear that, but at the mention of Russia, hail and snow started pummeling on my study window. Um, I promise it's not just incredibly atmospheric uh, background sound effects. It's nature itself, either being incredibly complimentary or deeply irritating for this section. Oh my goodness, is it the apocalypse? Also en route from Russia, which you can imagine due to the signs against my window, was Alfred McRae, an Australian who had been helping to manage a copper mine in Siberia. Recently engaged, McRae was travelling to Canada for an extended holiday with friends. He would take the train north when he reached New York on the Titanic. Not only an industrious and successful man, Mr McRae, the only Australian in second class, also had a dash of aristocratic blood because his late grandmother, the artist Georgina McRae, had been the illegitimate daughter 
of the last Duke of Gordon, a Scottish nobleman who had had an affair with Georgina's mother. Uh, we don't know whether she was an actress or a maid or a singer. The sources aren't clear. Um, but Georgina was the Duke's uh, biological daughter. McRae didn't talk much about his aristocratic connections, in contrast to another second-class passenger who claimed falsely to be an aristocrat. A used car salesman from the Netherlands, Alfred Nurney, had tried to win a free upgrade to first class on the Titanic by claiming on the first day of the voyage that he was a German aristocrat called Baron Alfred von Drachstadt. But the Titanic's hospitality crew politely yet firmly reminded him that it was green notes, not blue blood, that gained admittance to first class. At which point Nurney, still claiming to be a baron, forked over the money and got moved to first class. The majority of the Titanic's second-class passengers were British and thoroughly impressed with their accommodation. Second class was decorated in sombre, elegant woods like mahogany or oak. While the style of decorating was very conservative and thus assumed to be the least divisive, there were some innovations for passengers' comfort. The Olympic and the Titanic were the first ocean liners to offer an elevator for second-class travellers, which was thoroughly appreciated if you happened to have a cabin on E or F deck and wanted to go up to take the air on the boat deck without climbing the six flights of stairs. The elevator was manned by a bellboy who, I can only assume, suffered from absolutely no form of motion sickness. One of the British passengers on board was a science teacher called Lawrence Beasley, educated at Keyes College of Cambridge University, where he took a first in natural sciences. He was a meticulous scientist, but also a convert to the new religion of Christian science. Beasley would survive the Titanic disaster and later wrote a best-selling memoir about his experiences on the ship. After his first night, and then first breakfast on the Titanic, he went up on deck as the Titanic reached her final European stop before New York. This was the Irish port of Queenstown on the southeastern coast of Ireland. The village had once been known as the Cove of Cork, Cork being its nearest city. But it had been formally renamed Queenstown in 1849 after a visit to it by Queen Victoria. Today, the town is known by the Irish version of its original English name, Cove, pronounced the same way but spelled in Irish C-O-B-H with a fada over the O. The name of Cove legally replaced Queenstown following Irish independence from the United Kingdom in 1921. So in 1912, when Lawrence Beasley watched the town approach from the Titanic, it was still called Queenstown. Beasley's words about that morning are read for us by Paul Storrs. The coast of Ireland looked very beautiful as we approached Queenstown Harbour. The brilliant morning sun showing up the green hillsides and picking out groups of dwellings dotted here and there above the rugged grey cliffs that fringed the coast. We took on board our pilot, ran slowly towards the harbour with the sounding line dropping all the time, and came to a stop while out to sea, with our screws churning up the bottom and turning the sea all brown with sand from below. Passengers and mail were put on board from two tenders, and nothing could have given us a better idea of the enormous length and bulk of the Titanic than to stand as far astern as possible and look over the side from the top deck, forwards and downwards to where the tenders rolled at her bows, the merest cockle shells beside the majestic vessel that rose deck after deck above them. Truly, she was a magnificent boat. As Beasley mentioned, just like at Cherbourg the previous day, the Titanic was too big to dock in Queenstown. So two tenders did the work of bringing people, luggage 
cargo and mail on and off the Titanic while she waited at anchor just off the coast. Enthusiasts from the Royal Cork Yacht Club, one of the oldest and most prestigious yacht clubs in the world, hired smaller boats to take them out to see the Titanic up close, and several of the yachting devotees snapped photographs of the world's largest liner. A few passengers left the Titanic at this stage, having used it as a sort of cross-channel or overnight ferry. One of the passengers who left, who later became of historical significance, was a trainee Irish Catholic priest, Francis Brown, who had been travelling in first class with his camera. Father Brown, as he was after completing his vocational training with the Jesuits, would later become one of Ireland's most talented, prolific and important 20th century photographers, and his zeal started early. Because he left the Titanic safely at Queenstown, we have many photographs from Brown of the ship in service between England, France and Ireland. I've mentioned that Lawrence Beasley was a scientist particularly interested in engineering and technology. You can really see that in this next extract from his memoirs, where he recounts what it was like saying goodbye to Queenstown as the Titanic headed out into the Atlantic Ocean proper. Only nine years earlier, the first aeroplane flight had happened, and Beasley shows here both his slightly endearingly nerdy scientific enthusiasm, big talk on being a nerd from the historian I know who said, not two episodes, how much I love theological history in a tone of breathless excitement, but he also shows his prescience because Beasley wondered if the aeroplanes that were just beginning to be developed might one day replace great ships like the Titanic in crossing the Atlantic. Beasley's words are again read by Paul Storrs. Presently, the work of transfer was ended. The tenders cast off. And at 1.30pm, with the screws churning up the sea bottom again, the Titanic turned slowly through a quarter circle until her nose pointed down along the Irish coast and then steamed rapidly away from Queenstown. The little house on the left of the hill gleaming white on the hillside for many miles astern. In our wake soared and screamed hundreds of seagulls, which had quarrelled and fought over the remnants of lunch pouring out of the waste pipes as we lay to in the harbour entrance. And now they followed us in the expectation of further spoil. I watched them for a long time and was astonished at the ease with which they soared, and kept up with the ship with hardly a motion of their wings. Picking out a particular gull, I would keep him under observation for minutes at a time, and see no motion of his wings downwards or upwards to aid his flight. He would tilt all of a piece to one side or another, as the gusts of wind caught him, rigidly unbendable as an aeroplane tilts sideways in a puff of wind. And yet, with graceful ease, this seagull kept pace with the Titanic, forging through the water at twenty knots. It was plain that the seagull is possessed of a secret that we humans are only just beginning to learn, that of utilising air currents as escalators up and down, which he can glide at will with the expenditure of the minimum amount of energy. Aviators, of course, are imitating the goal. And soon perhaps may we see an aeroplane or glider dipping gracefully up and down in the face of an opposing wind, and all the time forging ahead across the Atlantic Ocean. All afternoon, we steamed along the coast of Ireland, with grey cliffs guarding the shores and hills rising behind, gaunt and barren. As dusk fell, the coast rounded away from us to the northwest, and the last we saw of Europe was the Irish mountains dim and faint in the dropping darkness. 
with the thought that we had seen the last of land until we set foot on the shores of America, I retired to the library to write letters, little knowing that many things would happen to us all. Many experiences, sudden, vivid and impressive to be encountered, many perils to be faced, many good and true people for whom we should have to mourn before we saw land again. As he wrote his letters that day, Beasley was particularly impressed by the second-class library, located on Sea Deck, where it served as second class's main socialising spot. It had, as its name suggests, a lending library. I know, you come to this channel for a historian to tell you such earth-shattering revelations like a library had books in it. Groundbreaking, niche, informative, I know. But the library also served as a kind of lounge and meeting area. On the deck above, there was a smoking room for second-class passengers, or more specifically, for second-class men. While attitudes about women smoking in public were relaxing on French and German passenger ships, on the generally more socially conservative British liners, the smoking rooms in first, second and third class were still considered men only, a kind of cross between either a members club or a pub on land. This was an April voyage ahead of the much busier summer season, and so second class on the Titanic for this trip was only about half full, with 284 passengers. This was good news for second class passengers who weren't travelling, with friends or relatives. Cabins in second class had bunk beds, and you paid for the bed not the whole room. So if you were travelling in second class at a time when it was fully booked, you would end up with a roommate for the week. Fingers crossed that you liked them, but there was no guarantee. Kate Buss, an English woman who had boarded in Southampton, had waited anxiously until Queenstown to see if she would end up having to share her cabin. But once the ship set off from Southern Ireland... Kate could relax. She had the cabin to herself. I imagine it was a bit like a dialed-up version of that angst on the train where you worry someone will sit next to you at each new stop, and I don't think that's just me who worries about it. Kate was another passenger who was using the Titanic as a splendid stepping stone. She was emigrating to the United States to join her fiancé, Sam. It was fairly common at the time for men who were planning to emigrate to go ahead to the new country to find work, raise money, and then bring their families over to join them. Sam Willis, who, like Kate, was British, had settled in California, where he found work as a carpenter and decorator. Now that he was comfortably established in America, Kate could join him. Her brother Percy had escorted her to Southampton, where he said goodbye as she boarded the Titanic. She was bringing her trousseau and wedding presents with her in her luggage, and once she reached New York, she would take the train another 3,000 miles across the United States to join Sam in California. While Kate was delighted that she didn't have to share her cabin, that didn't mean she wanted to be on her own for the rest of the voyage. Long journeys were a chance to make friends, and Kate ended up chatting to the people with whom she shared a table in the dining saloon at mealtimes, as well as winning new friends when she went for a walk on deck. It was still considered fairly unusual for an unmarried woman to travel on her own in 1912, which Kate's surviving letters make clear. Kate Boss is, in fact, I think, a fantastic source on life in second class on the Titanic. She was a mixture of excited joy at reuniting with Sam for their wedding, but also homesickness for her family in England. 
She therefore wrote a lot of letters during her time on the Titanic. Late at night on Thursday the 11th, Kate settled down in her cosy cabin on E-deck to write this. Her words are read for us by Joanne Doody. Dear all, it is about 11pm by your time, but we have to put our watches back about an hour or so each day. We didn't reach Queenstown until midday and I hear we will be arriving in New York on Tuesday night and land Wednesday morning. I wrote to Percy, but left that letter in my bag by mistake when the others were posted at Queenstown, but I remembered to post my postcards. I'm having a really good time. I gained courage and went up on the deck in the morning. While standing there, this young lady offered to share her steam chair rug. I accepted. We asked questions about each other. She is going to get married too. She's going to Oregon. But her fiancé is meeting and marrying her in New York. She, like me, has her wedding presents with her in her luggage. I'm quite the centre of attention to a few who know that I am undertaking this voyage alone, and the doctor thinks Sam must be a grand man if he's capable of leading me to make such a sacrifice of home and country to make such a journey alone. I have eaten everything and anything. We are living very well. I wrote letters last night and some again this morning. We've been up on deck a good deal. In the hall lounge above my cabin, the band plays every afternoon and evening. Everybody seems to be happy. There were a few problems in second class, which was to be expected in a brand new ship. Chief among them, the fact that some of the taps or faucets for our transatlantic friends weren't working in a few of the second class lavatories. There was also a problem with the heating in a couple of the cabins, particularly in one occupied by Lutty Parrish and Imanita Shelley, a mother and daughter from Kentucky. But given that they complained over a dozen times in a very short period of time that their room was either an icebox or a prison cell, there was the suspicion that they were exaggerating things and, like the fake Baron, they were hoping that if they complained enough they'd score a free upgrade. The Titanic began to incrementally increase her speed on the first day out from Ireland, which added to the vibrations Kate Buss felt in her cabin, which annoyed her late at night. However, the general consensus was that the Titanic was behaving much better than some of her competitors. A few passengers who had previously travelled on the rival Lusitania, one of the fastest ships in the world, said that the Titanic was a much smoother and more comfortable ship precisely because she wasn't trying to match the Lusitania or Mauritania's great speed. The next day, Friday the 12th, would be the first full day spent at sea with no stopover to break up the journey. Thank you so much to Joanne Doody and Paul Stores for lending their time and talent to reading the words of Kate Buss and Lawrence Beasley for today's episode. It's very much appreciated. Do tune in tomorrow to hear about life in first class and why the Titanic's own designer was suffering terribly from homesickness. Wherever you are, I hope you enjoyed this serving of history and the rest of your day. Mm-hmm.